Hello, my friends. I'm Gene Dallasala with Audioholics. And today I would like to discuss a very important topic, power. How are you guys delivering power to your home theater equipment? I see a lot of people bragging about their giant amplifiers, about how many watts, thousands of watts they can deliver to their home theaters. But a lot of people aren't doing dedicated outlets to these power amplifiers. In fact, they're using shared outlets probably the same outlet that their teenage daughter in the next room is using to blow dry her hair. So what happens when you're using a shared outlet? What kind of power are you really getting into your amplifiers and how much are you losing as a result of not having a dedicated outlet? That's what I'd like to talk to you about for a little bit here. I put together a little editorial and I also put some measurements together of a real world amplifier that I'm currently having under test. This is quite a hulking amplifier. It's the Anthem STR uh, two-channel amplifier. Retails for about $6,000. I'm currently reviewing it. This is a monster. It's 600 watts times two into four ohms, both channels driven. Very beefy amp section in it. And you can see here, it's got two giant toroids, two pairs of heat sinks with output devices, 16 output devices per channel. They're bridged together. That's why you're getting that kind of power. This is the kind of amplifier that you want to feed dedicated power to. And I'm going to show you why in a little bit after we talk about some of the editorial considerations of what we are discussing. So if you look at a typical outlet that's in a domestic situation, now I'm focusing mostly on USA, which is 120 volts. Obviously, if you're in Europe and you're 220, or if you're in Japan or Asia, it's 100 volts. So it's the same kind of principles, just different voltages that you're working with. Typically, uh, an outlet in a domestic situation is 120 volts, 15 amps. That gives you an output of about 1,800 watts max. If you try to exceed the 1,800 watts for any extended period of time, you're probably going to trip a breaker in your uh, garage. I don't know if anybody's ever done that. If you're blow drying your hair and somebody plugs in a uh, vacuum cleaner into the same outlet and turns it on, all of a sudden you have no power to that circuit. You hear people screaming, they can't dry their hair, and you gotta go out in the garage and, and flip the switch. Anyways, that's the kind of situation that we're talking about here. Now when you move up to a dedicated 20 amp, 120 volt line, you get a 20% increase in available power. So you get about 2160 watts available on a 20 amp line. Now 20% doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it actually is a pretty good amount. Not only because it's a, it, it gives you a few extra 100 watts uh, of power, but it's really because you're getting a dedicated outlet. You're not sharing this outlet with other devices that are plugged into your switch or your outlet um, circuit. So I wanted to go over basically a scenario if you're setting up a home theater in your family room. I wanted to show you the kind of power considerations you, you have to think about. So if you have, let's say, an HDTV, Typical HDTV will consume a couple hundred watts of power, depending on what technology you're running. And then you have like an AV receiver. You know, if you have a thousand watt, a thousand dollar receiver, it could consume um, you know around 800 watts. Some of them are more powerful. The older receivers that had bigger amp sections in them, like the old Denons and Yamahas, those things can use a full 12 to 15 amps of wall current. In fact, when I had the Denon AVR5805 years ago, that was a 10 channel, 170 watts times 10 that had a dedicated outlet because that thing was a monster. You don't get that as much these days with the mid-level receivers, but they are still power hungry, especially because you're driving nine, sometimes 11 channels with them. So let's just use 800 watts as an example. And let's say you have one subwoofer plugged into the same outlet that consumes up to a thousand watts. You got a couple of source devices, whether it's a Blu-ray player or a couple of Fire Stick TVs, and you're looking at a total of about 2,100 watts. Now, in most cases, you're not consuming that kind of power steady state. It's a good rule of thumb to say you take the total wattage that you're using on that circuit, divide it by four, and that's the kind of wattage you, you have to see uh, to balance the load of that outlet. So in this scenario, this is not such a bad thing if you're not sharing the outlet and it's a 15 amp outlet, you're only using about a third of the power capability of that outlet. As you can see here, it's under 1800 watts, it's 525 watts you're probably okay. But now what happens when you start plugging in light fixtures? You know, there are outlets that typically have light fixtures in the ceiling and they use the same circuit in many cases. If you're using 460 watt bulbs, you're consuming an extra 240 watts and that's continuous. 
we're not talking about uh, divided by four in that case because that light is always on. So as you start doing that and you start adding that to the power here, you're getting closer and closer to that 1800 watt figure, especially if someone plugs in a vacuum or they start adding more devices over time. You start getting into an area where you're exceeding the load limits for that outlet. Now, I just wanted to talk to you about how equipment operates on an outlet or what kind of power you feed it. A typical product that consume, that's operates on 120 volts is designed to work within a range of voltage from your outlet, usually plus or minus 10%. That's where you get 108 volts on the low side RMS to 132 volts on the high side RMS. RMS. And that's where you want to be. You never really want to be on this low side. What happens when you get on the low side of the outlet uh, power is your line voltage starts sagging when you start consuming too much power. And the amplifier, for example, is trying to compensate, it's trying to pull in more current. That could actually damage an amplifier if you drop below the 108 volts, if you're dropping below the operational voltage that it's designed for. That's not a good thing. The other thing that can happen is if, as you start sagging the line and going below the 108 volts, the amplifier has what's called rail voltage that the output devices have to work on. That's how it amplifies a signal. Signal starts out small in the preamp and then it gets larger in the voltage stage and then the current has to, divide, has to um, provide all that power to your speaker. If you drop the rail voltages down, you start clipping that amplifier sooner, which means that the amplifier is going to distort way before it's rated power. So for example, if you have a 200 watt per channel amplifier that is on a sagged line, that amplifier could clip way before 200 watts. You could clip at 100 watts or even less, depending on what kind of load conditions you have. The other thing you have to look at too is there are cases, it's rare, but you could get an overvoltage situation. And what happens in that situation is if the line voltage is too high, you can operate that amplifier with a higher rail voltage, and that could damage capacitors that are meant to work within a few volts of that rail. So I'm not really gonna talk about that. That's really not the focus of this. The focus is to make sure your line voltage isn't sagging because you're overdriving your outlet and you're robbing your amplifiers of power. And that's really what I wanted to discuss here. So I wanted to show you some real world measurements that I took on that Anthem STR. And what I did was I took measurements of that amplifier on a 15 amp shared outlet, this outlet in this room that has all these lights plugged in, and then I did the same exact tests on a dedicated 20 amp line that uses nothing else that's plugged into it. And I wanted to show you the power differences. So if you look just with one channel driven at four ohms, this amplifier at 15 amp shared outlet was able to deliver its rated power of 600 watts. It actually delivered 643 watts at 0.1%, 675 watts at 1% distortion. But check out what happened when I had a dedicated 20 amp line. Now I have a little uh, measurement gaff here. This should be one channel driven here. But anyways, that 600 watts, I was able to now have more available power. I was able to get 723 watts at 0.1%, 763 watts at 1%. So just with one channel driven, even though I had enough available current on that outlet, I was able to get more power to that amplifier because that line voltage wasn't sagging. It kept the rail voltages higher. And of course, Anthem was conservative with this amplifier and it was, it's delivering more than it's rated 600 watts. So look what happens when we have two channels driven. At two channels driven with four ohms, this amplifier is rated at 600 watts a channel times two. I couldn't get more than 536 watts out of it at 0.1% and 562 watts at 1%. And what was happening is I saw the lights dimming above me as I was running this test and I monitored the rail voltage with an AC meter, and it dropped from about 116 volts RMS down to 106 volts. So again, I was operating in that dangerous region below the minimum voltage, below the 108 volts RMS, and that is not a good situation to be in. So look at how the power goes up now when I run it on a dedicated 20 amp line. Remember, 536, 562. Now we're at 671, 708. So that's a significant increase in power available. If I did not test this amplifier on a dedicated line, I would have originally thought it didn't need its power spec. I would have been all over it saying Anthem is lying about their power. Their 600 watt amplifier can't deliver more than 560 watts. You guys would be bitching because 
you would be spending six grand on an amplifier that doesn't meet its power spec. Well, it does meet its power spec. You just have to be careful and give it the right amount of power. As Scotty said, more power. Okay, we need more power to the warp engines. So as you can see here, there is benefit to having a dedicated outlet for a big hulking amplifier like this. And I wanted to show you a little bit more of the calculations I did to make you feel comfortable about that. So here's just a comparison table I wanted to show you. We look at about a 25% increase in power available by having that dedicated amp outlet for this big power amplifier. That's significant. But what's interesting to note is why, if we're only delivering 670 watts times two, you know, if you want to do the math on that, it's well under the 1800 watts, right? Well, you got to consider the efficiency of the amplifier. This is a class AB amplifier. So in the case where we're looking at the 15 amp line at the 562 watts divided by 78% efficiency, we're looking at delivering 1,440 watts. And that's why the line voltage was sagging because we're getting close to that 1,800 watts. Now in the case of the 20 amp line, when I was able to deliver 708 watts times two, we were pumping out 1,800 watts of power consumption. Obviously, this exceeds the 15 amp line. It would trip the fuse. Couldn't even get that far to keep the distortion level uh, within check. Because when I test amplifiers, I test at under 1%. I don't like driving amplifiers to hard clipping. If you could see an amplifier clipping on a scope, if it's a square wave on a scope, that's not useful power for a speaker. I'm very conservative when I measure amplifiers. I like to give you the power spec at 1% and 0.1% and even lower sometimes. So it definitely is a recommendation that you guys run a dedicated outlet. If you're running a big amplifier or if you just wanna run a home theater and you know that that outlet might be used for other things that could rob it of power, I would have an electrician come in. You know, you could tell if you have a dedicated outlet, usually they will put in one of these outlets and I'll show you a bigger picture of it. Usually you will see that little T kind of mark for the um, one of the power strips here. That means you have a dedicated 20 amp line. That's kind of like a hospital grade line. You'll see that at hospitals often. I've got about three dedicated outlets in my home theater room just to power my rack of equipment. And in fact, um, what happened when I ran, when I built my home, the electrician forgot to put a dedicated outlet for my subwoofers in my home theater room. So I have two of my five subwoofers running on a shared line. And if I leave the light fixtures on at the ceiling because it shares that circuit, and I start hitting some really hard bass, like if I listen to Dead Mount 5 or some kind of techno music that's got a lot of bass, I can see the light cans dimming every time the bass notes hit. Because I'm running two Validine subs, the DD15 pluses, and they can consume up to 2000 watts each. So again, you do that calculation, divide by four, and you're at, over a thousand watts of power consumption when you're hitting that base hard and the peaks go even higher than that fourth, one fourth estimate. And you can see why the line voltage is dropping, the, the um, outlet is dimming or the light fixtures are dimming as a result. It means that you're running out of power and you're not giving the right, right amount of power to that amplifier to deliver its max output. So that's about all I wanted to tell you guys. Um, take a look at this article if you want more explanation. But anytime you're able to run a dedicated line, even if it's a dedicated 15 amp line, it's still better than using a shared line. When you start plugging in various amplifiers, especially if they're the class AB that use more power than a class D, get a dedicated outlet, get two dedicated outlets if you can. If you're building a home now, talk to your electrician, tell them, hey, I wanna run dedicated outlets to my home theater system. Usually they will do it correctly. They won't just put a 20 amp fuse on a 20 amp line. They should use 12 gauge cabling. Remember, you want lower gauge cabling so you have less I squared R losses due to heat. You don't wanna run thin cable when you're putting a lot of current through it because then you lose your power through heat through the wire. So your electrician should know this and I would recommend checking with them if you're running uh, an outlet now to your home theater system or if you're retrofitting your home theater system. Talk to an electrician, make sure they know what they're doing. Tell them you want dedicated 20 amp lines. And then you should be good to go. Then you'll have all the power you need and you will thank me for it when you start getting your SPLs to the levels that you need to shake your cranium, to shake your spinal column. 
and to also have the bragging rights that you have a 300 watt times seven amplifier that can actually deliver its per channel and all channels driven spec if you feed it enough power. So guys, I'm kind of curious, are you running a dedicated outlet on your home theater? How many dedicated outlets are you running? Give me some stories down below in the comment section. Tell me if you've tripped breakers in the past when you plugged in too many amplifiers into your outlet, or if you're just, if your daughter turned on the hairdryer and it shut off your home theater in the process. I love hearing these kind of stories. And guys, until next time, keep listening.